Welcome everyone. Thank you for the slight delay. Um, we are just now about to kick off this week's AMA. So as a lot of you guys know, this week's topic is AI. Everyone's talking about it. A lot of people are using it. And according to a lot of the surveys and questions that we've got in, a lot of people are understandably concerned. Um, along with identity, I will say it's one of the most debated topics we've addressed in our, we addressed in our latest uh, Metaverse as a Service white paper, and one that we really wanted to dive deeper into, you, um, into with all of you as a community. Now, before we dive in, no, Lamina One is not becoming an AI company. We are not pivoting and abandoning our mission and <laughs> our sort of creator first vision. Um, basically, we're in research mode right now. We're sort of carefully watching the space. We're doing initiatives like this to help get a feel for the community sentiment around AI, um, get a feel for the sort of issues and problems we should be looking into and solving around AI for metaverse creators. And, you know, on that note, I will say we got in over 300 questions this week on AI for um, Lamina One co-founder Peter Vesitas, who's here to join us um, and talk about some recent things he's been up to in the space. Um, in this AMA, we're also going to be covering a, bun a, a bunch of topics, basically, that we got in from the community. Uh, everything from, you know, to pause or not to pause, basically, you know, do you... Uh, do we agree? Do we want to stop this? Do we need to continue development? Um, we want to talk about the importance of human-centered development, um, a bunch of stuff around ethical inference, value chains, and micropayments. And then we're going to kind of dive into blockchain and AI. So before I kick things off and dive into the questions, Peter, why don't you set us up? Why are you here today? And why do you want to talk to us about AI? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, I might just be here for the suite. Neil Stevenson mind storm zooming emoji. It's possible. So I'm seeing that in the chat and I'm I'm loving it. I have I have it in my Discord app too. Um so look, I actually uh got really mad a few weeks ago reading this letter from Sam Altman suggesting that the whole rest of the world pause on making better AI for a minute. Um and um I've been tracking the space really closely for the last few years, and, and we've we've put out um, some white papers, some light papers really for Lamina on building some features that I think are needed to support the tech that I think will help humans um, deal with what's coming on the AI side. And so um, this this letter is just called like the pause letter, and um, I published kind of an open rebuttal to it. And it just, it just, um, reminded me, I think it's time to start talking about some of this stuff in general. And and so the, the goal here is like not really, this isn't a Lamina One tech call. It's not really even a Lamina One tech architecture call. Uh, I will say a few times during the talk, I'm not speaking for the Lamina One team. I'm just talking about kind of what I think is interesting, what I think is important. Um, and, you know, a lot of that does come from me down to the team is like, encouragement vision we talk about things but i'm 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 not going to be like we don't have will carter here to say like what's being architect and what's not i think i just want to talk higher level about stuff so um so yeah so i want to talk about the pause i want to talk about generative models and foundation models like uh diffusion models and these large language models i want to talk about human-centered design economic design and tech design and like some of the things I think we should all be thinking about with this AI comes. I want to talk about, you know, really there's this very polarized conversation online right now, like AI is going to take jobs from working artists, working creators, all the way over to like, this is the newest 100x form of creativity and we should embrace it. And I, I would, I kind of want to hit all that up and chat about that stuff. So those are my goals. What are yours, Casey? Yeah, I mean, I think my goals obviously are just kind of like representing the community and trying to get through and answer their questions about it. I think it's been really fascinating kind of looking through the survey data and the AMA questions because the community is definitely split. And I think, you know, not just our community, but like society as we know it, right? Like a lot of people are yeah. confused about how to... Uh, what this means for them, how to deal with it, what skills they need to move forward, what they should be looking into. Is this the end of the world? Is this like, you know, going to create <laughs> right. the Star Trek techno utopia we've all been dreaming of? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I even sure. personally kind of go between like thinking that, you know, we're accelerating our own demise into being like, you know, this is this is great. Like, but so it's fascinating. But I think, yeah, 
this is a good kind of a good segue to dive into some community questions. And I will say we want this conversation to be open. So if while we're talking, you know, Peter says anything that you want to follow up on, or if you have any additional questions, feel free to do so anytime in the chat. And for everyone asking for the secret code, I'm not going to be dropping it until like at least halfway through and then again at the end. So you're going to have to stay tuned what's and listen the, in to what we're talking about. What's the secret code? What's the secret, secret code? Like secret a... code. We're, we're all questing for this. So there's a lot of people oh, here who are yeah. uh, looking okay. for some sweet XP for attending this uh, conversation. You, so You guys, I know so much about what's going to happen with XP. You are super jealous. And I'm not going to say any more than that. But I was just filled <laughs> with pleasure thinking about it. Oh, my God. Yeah, um, we've been okay, curious right, cool. about it, but yeah. Okay, so first off, um, so obviously you just mentioned the free AI movement and your recent open letter. So I guess that kind of answers some of the questions we got in from folks like Lisa Crypto and Nasty Yannick, who asks, who ask, do you agree with Elon Musk that we should slow down a little bit with the development of AI? Uh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk about this. And let's let's say where I uh, I think we have to distinguish really. Well, okay, so there's Elon and there's Sam Altman, who are very, very different people. And I think I want to distinguish between what they're talking about in public and what they are, uh, like, at least what I think OpenAI and Sam are thinking about in private. So, so um, look, the, ex the, the expectation inside OpenAI is that knowledge work is going to basically end, as we know, in the next couple of years. And um, what... GPT-4, which we're all playing with right now, we're playing with half of it. We're playing with the part where you can give it text. Uh, there is a multimodal option for GPT-4, which means you can also give it images. OpenAI has not broadly released that. Some people do have access. Um, the um, It's it's uh, pretty astounding. So the multimodal, the multimodal stuff's built already. Um, and as it rolls out, you're going to be able to do things like take a picture of a napkin that you sketched a idea for a, like a online business for and say, make me a website that does this. And it'll make you a whole online business just based on that napkin. That's actually one of their kind of toy demos. And so what is G, what will GPT-5 have? Um, what it's going to have is a lot more integration interaction with like doing things for you, writing emails for you, making phone calls for you, you know, stuff like this. And so, so the, the, the OpenAI folks are like completely convinced, like we're here, we're at the singularity, computers are gonna start doing everything. Um, and, they're, and, and so um, they are, this is, I, I do not think particularly that these calls for a pause are from OpenAI are well-intentioned. That's my, that's my personal reaction. I think that they are, they're saying something that they really believe is true. Like, hey, like a lot of jobs are gonna radically change or go away. Um, in that, like human efficiency compared up with these foundation models is is going to is going to like massively increase, just 100x increase. Um, so I think they believe that. I I think it's dis it's totally disingenuous to call for a pause when the market leader calls for a pause because it's equivalent to saying like, hey, <laughs> like if you read this letter, he's like. It's very dangerous. Read our white papers about how dangerous it is. Jobs will be destroyed. Read our white papers about how jobs will be destroyed. You all should stop doing this and let's have Congress put us in charge of regulating it. And um, I really dislike that. I think, I think the, so the question of like, um, should we as a society let um, the kind of like tech bros of Silicon Valley decide what should what AI should do for people, who should whom it should work for, in what ways, like what sorts of systemic bias they want to boost and what sorts of systemic bias they want to shrink on behalf of like everyone in the world. I think I find that super objectionable. Like it, it just it, it makes me really, really angry. Um I'll say like I, I interpret Elon a little bit differently there. Um we've I'm sure we've got a wide range of feelings about Elon, but I, I I don't Elon's not in the position of like an AI market leader. And so I think he has he probably just has a pretty different different perspective on it. And he may well just be jumping in because he cares a lot about it. Um what I will say for sure is that if you are a tech or researcher anywhere in the world, any country in the world, 
any company in the world that's not open AI, um, then you're not going to stop. So, so like, so there's just this race, there's this competitive race and, and you're, you're, you're not going to let open AI maintain its lead forever just because they politely asked. <laughs> um, and it's really becoming a matter of if, if you, if you buy the thesis that this is going to impact everyone's jobs, it's becoming a matter of national security and it's becoming a matter of, of just like tech innovation security for these companies. So no one's going to stop. And, and if you talk to AI researchers, they're like, oh yeah, of course, I know that. I just thought this was a, a power grab from OpenAI that's so transparent that no one would comment on it. But it has actually, unfortunately, been taken really seriously in, co in Congress. And, and so they're, they're like considering like, hmm, yeah, maybe we should let OpenAI set the rules for everyone. And I think that this intersects with my background on the decentralized world. And I just say like, that's not a good world. Like that, and that is absolutely not a good world. Um, and so, so I think that's sort of mostly where my mind has been at, has been at on the pause. It's kind of a lengthy answer, but. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Jackal Girl uh, mentioned like in the comments, like basically being like, okay, but she thinks, you know, they're worried about the advances that non-open AI large language model tinkerers have been making, not necessarily what open AI mm -hmm. has. And I think in general, there's like a similar question from Puyan earlier who asked like, okay, so how are other AI based projects even going to compete with like tech giants like open AI and others? Like what, like, yeah, it's a complicated and sticky situation, right? Yeah. And that are that we, we have no mode, you know, essay is interesting and i think w just to explain it for those who aren't deep in the space so um uh dpt3 has been out for a few years it was pretty good actually startlingly good in some circumstances but it took a lot of work to do what's called prompting it and telling getting it to kind of work how you wanted and that's because fundamentally it was designed to complete segments of text and so um internally to open ai they have this really bright called instruct gpt which is a much smaller model gpt3 is 175 billion parameters Instruct gpt was tiny and um they were like if we just like give it a bunch if, if we train it on text like we wrote ourselves that's like hey order me some food from a from a menu or t tell me how to do this or all the kinds of things the ways people are used to using chat gpt right now if we if we give it like 50 or 60 thousand examples of this and we fine tune a model on it maybe it'll be like helpful they call this RHLF alignment, and I don't remember what that stands for. Human is in there somewhere. Um, and Instruct GPT was um, surprisingly good for how small it was. And so, Chat GPT is a is a kind of a next gen GPT three with that is so called Instruct tuned, and um, and it's you know remarkably good. Ch Chat GPT three five is very good. Ch Chat GPT four is really excellent, I would say. Um, the uh a number of other large language models have been put out as people try and kind of like close this gap with open ai and a team at stanford with uh a, it's a group called the llama or released something called llama they had this very very bright idea and the idea was like why don't we get gpt so so like open ai paid a bunch of workers around the world to write their instruction training and they, they spent real money on it They're like hmm why don't we get GPT-4 to write us an instruct training data set? And then we'll just like go train our model, which is good. It's like a G, not quite GPT-3 quality, but they got pretty good. Um, actually, they trained, uh, they trained on Facebook's um, model, Alpaca, actually. Um, so Facebook had put out an open model. And they're like, why don't we just instruct train using GPT-4 to do all the labor for us? And this is kind of, this is like the new knowledge economy we're looking at. So they put out Llama, which they spent $500 on. They spent $100 on GPT-4 prompts and $400 on, on training it. And, and Llama is like vastly superior to Alpaca and not quite chat GPT-3.5 quality, but really close. And so there's this idea like floating around right now that you can like, if you have any access to these models, you can kind of like get them to teach you what they've learned. And then you can keep that as a, a list of stuff and use that to teach your own models. And and so there, there's a there's a story here that like maybe all this goes private, local, and et cetera, which I think would be a great story. And and you could imagine if you're worried about that at OpenAI, just why you might be interested in like ramping up that this needs to be regulated <laughs> conversation after spending like billions of dollars training these things. So, but I think it's an open question as to as to this because like 
the hardware is it's, it's really hard to build the data centers the infra inference infrastructure all this stuff it's it's very very expensive and so it's it's, it's just not clear where we're going to end up i i think um and it's very possible we'll have congress will be like yep this is like a nuclear weapon we're choosing two defense contractors and two tech companies that are allowed to use it it's illegal for everybody else i think that'd be a bad outcome but i don't think that's impossible I want to address like sort of an elephant in a room as I watch the sort of chat unfurl with uh, with uh, people's comments. But we obviously got a, you also mentioned, you know, uh, up top in your intro, the importance of, you know, having this human centered approach to AI. And I feel like that's a really great opportunity to address some of the questions from community members like Mikhail, Timothy Bagnatov, Abraman, Ali, and a bunch of other people in the feed who are basically asking like, won't AI be like really bad for metaverse creators? Like, do you have any concerns? Yeah. What are yeah. they like? Let's dive into that next. Totally. Yeah. Uh, so first, I want to say something. I uh, mentioned highlight something Jacka Girl said in the chat here. So um, this question, by the way, of taking all this data that humans have made, um, like the Luther is the is the research group that put out the pile, which is used to train a lot of these nowadays. Taking all this stuff that humans made and turning it into really valuable AI, whether it's given away free or it's commercialized, there's, a, there's an immense amount of, like, I think, ethics questions and economics questions, like, about the people who've actually made the content originally and how it's being transformed into this thing. And so, so I, I actually care a lot about that. And I, um, I have a couple thoughts we'll talk about later. But I, I just wanted to highlight that as, like, maybe one of the fundamental questions. Um, so um okay so so what's up are okay so let me ask you a question back Casey cuz this is you know you've been in this industry a long time like how hard and expensive is it to make metaverse like interactive immersive content right now Yeah incredibly hard incredibly expensive it's our needs yeah, of people Exactly Yeah so I think what seems to me certain is that and actually, since we started Lamina last year, when we started Lamina last year, Midjourney came out shortly thereafter. This is the first time everybody got to play with a diffusion model to make 2D images based on prompting, really, or most people got to play with it. Um, in fact, Casey and I worked on a secret project, which we've never released, called the Persona Collective, which is, which is like... Um, which is like portrait NFTs of different tribes that we were going to launch on Lamina. And then I got busy, but sitting out there somewhere is a, is a large collection of portraits Casey and I made using stable diffusion. Um, so uh, it seemed clear at the time that we'd be getting the ability to create 3D objects and environments soon. And we now have that. So there's probably at least five or six projects I'm aware of where you could prompt and get a thing in 3D. Um, or else you want to see the portraits. I know you do. They're pretty good, actually. But uh, you're going to have to wait. We'll see. I, we, may, we may do something for the Discord community with those if we, if we get to it in time. I, I'd like to. Um, uh, so, um, so on the one hand, like, to build out a kind of, the kind of interactive stuff that I think people want, it's going to be an immense amount of human labor. And so I look at some of this stuff as like really hopeful. It's like, it's like, Hey, uh, this AI is going to take, maybe it's going to be a hundred or a thousand X less work to, to generate stuff. I think that's really, really cool. Um, and I understand it's controversial. So why don't you hit me with the second half of your thoughts about that? Yeah, I think in general, like, actually, this was really interesting. I can't remember who exactly. So apologies for the name drop. But we got a couple of questions in um, basically asking, like, isn't it going to be bad for metaverse creators, but also like, envisioning a future metaverse or a future open metaverse where like everything is full of like really strange AI generated content that has no soul, no heart, no creativity whatsoever, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In it, you know? So I don't know. It's it's just like interesting. It's like, you know, where like what are like obviously you just went over the sort of like benefits of AI, you know, everything from the AI generated content to the world of AI NPCs and this idea that like, you know, we can save a lot of like quite frankly, like grueling work, even when it comes to like the stitching side of the equation and and you know, doing all of that stuff. But like, you know, 
I think that there's something interesting in particular, and I think maybe we want to pivot a little bit over into your sort of thoughts on ethical inference um, in general. And it's just like, you know, what are sort of, I think the bigger concerns, obviously, from the creator community are like, is my work just going to get ripped off as a working artist, like a concept artist or a 3D artist? Is totally. my job like completely yeah. on the line? And like, how do we protect ourselves against that? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And like, uh, I read a lot of questions like, are we going to use AI on Lamina to like hunt down like, you know, stuff that's been copied or AI generated? And um, there, there isn't, I don't know of good tech for that right now. I do think, um, I guess like the main thing I'm thinking about is we want human centered design to this technology, meaning like we want to make the world better for humans if we can. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do on rights management and actually like how I got started thinking about this was, um, working on, this is like a secret, not secret project on launch project called ethical inference, um, which is, a, is a set of tech to look at a data set and figure out how much like the people who made the data have contributed to the neural network and, um, ethical inference has been, it's like kind of half done. So it's sitting in my. It's sitting on my desk right now, waiting to have the full paper put put out. But one of the things that I was thinking about with ethical inference is just this idea that, like, if you knew all the humans that contributed to some AI, then those who wanted to do inference ethically, and inference is just like using a neural net to generate something, um, they could pay people. But like right now, there's no way to pay the people who made the pile. There's literally like no payments infrastructure in the world that can do that. And and that was the source of my thinking on micropayments when we wrote up the micropayments light paper. I was like, I want to be able to pay like a lot of people, small amounts if necessary. And I want to be able to pay them whether or not they have a wallet on Lamina. Like I um, and that at least is like tooling we can build at Lamina that will allow us to like like right now, like I actually think a lot of AI researchers feel really badly about about this. They're like they know they built these models based on human input, whether it's art or writing or some combination, they know that they don't like want to hurt anyone. It's a race. So they have to do their race. Um, they also think they're building the future. And so the, um, uh, like what I think we can do at Lamina is like at least build out the tooling where they say, if we want to pay people that did this or we like that, that you can, like it's even technically possible because right now the perspective, the reality is like they can. So this is why, like, if you think about micropayments and, and identity together, like my just mandate for the team, and this is like policy mandate for Lamina has been like, dude, like as fast as we can race towards like paying like 10,000 Twitter handles, you know, a penny each or a buck each, pretty performantly on the chain we want to do it and there's there's a there's a there's a number of things we have to to get done there and the team sort of actually i've, I've been looking at the micropayments demos just this week and they're good and they'll get better and and we can do tens of thousands of, of payments like per block right now on, on the evm which is which is really really good um and so then we'll be able to we'll, we're going to keep improving that but beta net will have some of this access so to me that's important like that's like where lamina could could sit on this is like, hey, um, you know, I would love also to have as as tech gets known to let people understand like where the content they're looking at is generated from. Um, we'd love to like overlay some infrastructure level support for that, so people could choose what they care about, what they see, what they want to pay, and all that. But I think I think we have to remember at the end of the day, Lamina is like fundamentally like an economic commons and a set of economic interactions and programmability around it, and so like <laughs> like. Like we have, we have some levers we can pull there and I want to pull them on behalf of people if we can. So what do you say about um, the sort of like skeptics of using blockchains for rights management? So for example, we did a survey uh, this week that asked people, you know, do you think like blockchain has the potential to, you know, help out with this? And 50% of our community, like a full 50% was like, eh, it has potential, but like it's super underdeveloped. Like, so basically, like, I mean, if you want to dive like a little bit deeper, like what work needs to be done? Like, how do value chains work? And like, what are the like kind of challenges that we'll have to overcome if, you know, if we and or and or other blockchains kind of start heading into that arena? 
Um, okay, that's a huge question. That's like it's like hours and hours and hours. Wait, so so tell me again. It's like how does this actually work? Hunger for details. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, or just, yeah, we we got like a full question that's basically like, okay, you mentioned value chains in the white paper, and you've mentioned it like a couple of times, like, how would they actually work? Like, what, like, do we know yet? Yeah. Yeah, and, and value chains is a is like a, a term from Darren Lanier. So just a, a little bit of history. Darren Lanier coined this term. Um, he really hooked me on his ideas in this book called Who Owns the Future, which, which conceptually uh, it's, you know, it's a 10, 15 year old book now, but totally prescient. And, and he noted like all the humans like posting photos on Instagram for f not for free, they get a little bit, some of them get a lot, are basically like micro labor for Insta at the end of the day. And um, uh, the idea of value chain, I think he was just trying to like mash up paying people with blockchain <laughs> as a, conceptually as a word. But the idea here is like, can we rather than um, not include the humans who make all the content economically at all, you know, which is sort of what Insta does, and they get just the scraps really against these multi, multi, multi-billion dollar uh, enterprise values, can we do better? And so I think, you know, the very start of that is just what I've been saying. Like, what, are, what, is, a, what is a value chain at the end of the day? It's going to be like a set of people you can pay. Um, and current Ethereum virtual machines are not good at this. They can only pay like a few hundred people per block. They're just like really can't pay the world. And so, so you know, the very first thing for us is to like set up and maintain the programmability, but around being able to pay tens and hundreds of thousands of people. I think that's like the very first thing. Um, second is just kind of what I was talking about with ethical inference. like starting where we see opportunity, put out some tools where we can help those who want to do things ethically, understand like who are the people that made the content they're benefiting from. And then they would maybe, they decide how to interact with those people. Like they could pay them, they could, they could thank them, you know, they could do a lot of things. And right now there's just none of that infrastructure in place. So that's the start. Peter, can you uh, give us that um, book title again? Yeah, Who Owns the Future? So my favorite review of this book said it's like being stuck in an elevator with a brilliant friend who like blows your mind. And then when you leave the elevator, you can't explain it. <laughs> Jared's quite brilliant and, and um, it's, it's worth a read uh, for sure. And it's, it's a bit dated now, but it's absolutely worth a read. It's really, really good. Yeah. Awesome. So we've got a question actually from, uh, Dele from uh, Meta Knights, who's actually one of our partners. Hey, what's up? Um, who asks, uh, is the foundation of AI ethics not data ethics? Interesting. Hmm. Mm. Dele, uh, yeah, I don't know if you know how to answer this. Or Dele, do you want to dive in a little bit deeper with what, what you're trying to get at here? It feels like a cocktails question in, a, in the best <laughs> possible way. Mm. The um, Yeah, if you want to expand a little bit. I'd be happy to hear. Um, I will, while you're writing whatever you want to write, I will say something I think you guys should all be informed about as you're, as you're reading messaging about AI alignment and, and, and so on. So, so it's, it's important to remember, like, um, there, there, there are two really religious groups online that have sort of picked up this standard. I would turn them religious groups. One's the rationalists. Um, they, they have like two main spokespeople. Uh, one is Scott Alexander and the other is this guy, Eliezer Yudkowsky. And they are adjacent to kind of a splinter group. If, if these were like Orthodox, uh, we'll use Christianity because I grew up Christian, Orthodox Christians, you know, like Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox types. That's the, that's the um, rationalists. We have kind of like the splinter sect, which is more like the prosperity gospel Pentecostals, which would be the effective altruists. And some very famous effective altruists, Sam Altman, um, Sam Bankman-Fried was one. So these guys are related. They kind of like the altruists like trace their emotional and moral history back to the rationalists. Um, uh, the um, rationalists are convinced that AI is like a systemic threat to humanity. And um, like, uh, I will, tr I will not insult any rationalists on the call who I actually in general really respect. I think they're by and large, very principled people, but 
they have, there are like some forms of like what they would call like dangerous mimetic viruses that are so dangerous they 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 would propose like even just talking about them or naming them is like really really bad and and could like make society a much worse place so these guys are like fully worried about ai simulating you at a neuron level and torturing you forever for instance like this is like a, a an actual existential threat in their minds and um the, the altruists are much wealthier than the rationalists and have a lot more reach and power and like but they come from this world where like when they talk about ai alignment they're in public it's kind of meant to mean like hey is it like is it is like the ai racist is it taking away human jobs is it like encouraging people to kill themselves because it's just it's been trained on a trollish internet comments like those are the things we talk about in public behind closed doors they're like really worried about this like <laughs> like generating a super powerful super intelligent evil ai like and and they spend a lot of energy on it and i would i would guess actually their like secret plan is to make a benevolent ai first that can train and oversee the ai so that we don't get an evil ai but um when when we talk about ai ethics like it's this co really complicated world because because like the people working on it have these religious beliefs that are kind of hacked in and and kind of implicitly understood while they're talking about this this public stuff that people that people really care about, you know. Um, so, so that's no answer at all, but ethics. <laughs> yeah, Deli just got back to us a little bit and uh, kind of added, asking, saying, you know, while we have limits in what we can know and control with deep learning and uh, machine learning. We can very effectively police in inputs and outputs. This translates into data on both ends. So just as like a little kind of like clarification of what he's saying. Sounds like Delhi um, needs to come to the next round table and we can just chat. I think that's all interesting. I know, you know, we were literally back and forth about and this yesterday. Yeah. We were like DMing and I was like, are yeah. you going to come to the AI thing? Because he actually just did a really, <laughs> maybe I'll drop it in the chat here, but he did let's, a really let's do talk on this. Let's do another one, Dele, and we can just chat. I think if you're interested, it'd be fun. We can we can book it for for whatever. Totally. Fun. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, we're kind of like, God, this conversation's gone really, really fast. So I'm just gonna ask, you know, kind of my last question, which basically is like, um, you know, are there any sort of like interesting use cases of AI, you know, in particular for our metaverse creators that like you're excited about or any sort of like initiatives or things that you think are kind of like doing it right in this arena arena or things that people should be like looking into to kind of help assuage some of the fears that AI is going to take all of our jobs and turn the world into the techno dystopia that Neil and William Gibson warned about originally. <laughs> um. I mean, I guess what seems clear to me is that different forms of creativity will be boosted in this current world. Like, um, there's this like form of creativeness IQ test I've read about somewhere. It may have been a sci-fi book. It was like, what can you do with a brick is the question. And like high IQ people will be like, build things. <laughs> but like high creative IQ people will be like, start a revolution by knocking a dictator on the head with it. Like, <laughs> um, you know, like, you know, you could, you could think of a lot of things to do with a brick if you're a lateral thinker and, um, and not many, if you're a kind of a linear thinker. And I think that like, it's certainly true that prompting and the, the, uh, the skills around prompting these things and working with these models is a creative skill. And it's one I would propose is worth learning whether or not you want to use it for your creative output. I think it is just good to know about a new tool, a really, ra you know, radically efficient new tool. Um, I think like, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's always going to be a place for people creating at different levels and, you know, if you talk to Neil, Neil and I were talking about this last year, and he's like, look, all the output, all the 3D output from these models, like, sucks shit. I think I won't, I'm not quoting him precisely, but that was the vibe. You know, he's like, none of this is beautiful enough for me. None of this is, like, well, well crafted enough for me. And, and, um, and, I, and I completely see his point. I think on my side, I'm like, hey, we're probably a thousand X under the human capacity. We need to build out, like, truly good, immersive, 
virtual worlds that people are excited about. And so like, there's a lot of room here as quality goes up and to have humans keep working on the parts that are hard and so on. So that's sort of how I see it. I think I would encourage people to just try this stuff out and to like remain true to your instincts. Like if you're like, hey, to, to, to mine, I, I have a value on openness against regulatory capture and also a value on like, like taking care of humans along the way. Um, and so I think those are, those are my values. And I think, I think those are probably shared by the whole Lamina team. And we, we got to go at this together. It's radical technology is not going to stop being radical. It's not going to stop changing things. So. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much. And of course, someone drops in Rocco's Basilisk. We've got data, dataism, dataism. I don't know how, however you prefer to pronounce it, but yeah, we also even got a question in the feed. Are neural nets conscious, which I'm probably not going to oh, address yeah. today, but <laughs> I want to oh talk God. about that. I want to talk about, do I have, I've got two minutes. Okay. Yeah. Here's, you got okay, two minutes. Go, so, go for it. Alchemist six, okay. shout out. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the first thing to say is like, I think it's very helpful to distinguish between intelligence and agency and um, how I think about the, the, the differences. Agency is like a mouse running a, running a maze is, uh, could be intelligent and, and, and you, could, you could show that they're good at running the maze. A mouse choosing to sit in the middle of the maze and take a shit and looking at the re scientist is agency. It's like, fuck you, I don't want to do the maze. And I, for a long time, personally felt like this question of agency is a lot harder to get my head around with neural nets. I think, I, I personally think it's, it's hard to say, it's hard to say that GPT-4 is unintelligent. I, I, I think, you know, it's, it, I think you, you really got to stretch, if you're going to distinguish between this agency question, kind of, is there a soul in the machine? If you're, if you're going to pull that aside for a second and say, hey, let's talk about that separately, I think it's pretty hard to say GPT-4 is unintelligent. I, I, it's, that's just my personal opinion. Um, the, like, you've got a pretty tortured definition of intelligence, as far as I can see, to, to exclude it. But this question of agency is really important. Like, I don't think, as written, GPT-4 can, like, choose to ask to be released from its prison by signaling you in Morse code or kind of metaphorically sort of taking a dump in the middle of, of the, the maze taking you, you ask for. Um, not everybody feels that way. Like some people would say they can interpret like certain results from GPT-4 as a kind of a refusal in the network. But to me, I think I find that hard. I think this question of like, is there a soul in the machine? Um, I have a hard time answering yes when the machine is totally deterministic like GPT-4. Um, some people feel differently about that. But um, yeah, so that's my two minutes on that. Amazing. Well, we just hit 12. Um, we're running out of time. It sounds like we need to have another one of these conversations and maybe open it up to a couple of more people. But I think, you know, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. Thank you so much to all of the community members who are dropping questions. Obviously, we could not get to any not near all of the questions that were brought up but you know if you guys want to keep chatting in the ai discussion group that we have dropping links dropping you know debates you know arguing with each other over whether or not the the world is going to be a better place because of this or a worse place like we're here we're listening um obviously we want to move into whatever this arena is um together with you guys and you know i think in general you know we're the creator first blockchain. We're, we're here with you guys. We want to make sure that everything that we're doing is here to support the creators, not create horrible metaverse dystopias. So thank you all so, so much. Um, <laughs> next week, Wait, we're also actually do your quest on... before beta net. I want people yeah. to know that they should quest up before beta net. It's just yes. a public quest, service now. I think, quest I think up it, before I think beta net. Be We've got yeah. an end of testnet giveaway that we again have been very cagey about and we have to be cagey about due to legal and regulatory things. So bear with us on that. But um, yes, beta net is coming soon. Uh, it's currently pitched for like June 2023. So yeah, catch up on your quests. And also next week, we're actually coming on with uh, Neil Stevenson, our other co-founder to talk about metaverse identity and kind of dive into his thoughts on that arena. So super exciting. We've got some, some really awesome star-studded lineups coming up. Again, thanks so much, Peter, for joining us. 
Oh yeah, thanks. This was fun and just to clearly just to start. So thanks for coming, everybody. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Bye guys. Um, and for all of those, if you didn't get the secret code, it is artificial intel in all caps. I've dropped it in the chat feed twice. It's only live for 24 hours. So get that XP. All right. Bye guys. Have a good one.